Tolkien Road Podcast, Episode 21, The Lord of the Rings, Prologue, Concerning Hobbits. Hi everyone, John Carswell here. Welcome to the Tolkien Road Podcast, your conversational guide to Middle Earth and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode of the podcast, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings by looking at the prologue, which examines important background information like the origin and nature of hobbits, Bilbo's white lie concerning the ring, and the origin of pipeweed. We also discuss Tolkien's fascinating narrative framework, which is sure to delight literature nerds everywhere. Please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Tolkien Road Podcast. This is episode 21. This In this episode, we'll be covering um, the prologue of The Lord of the Rings. And uh, that, that is after covering the foreword of The Lord of the Rings the last time. So eventually, one of these days, we're actually going to get to the actual story, The Lord of the Rings. I hope so. Yeah. <clears throat> I really do. Uh, Greta, how are you? I'm super. How are you? I'm super duper. Oh. Yeah. You raised me one. That's right. Nice. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so so there's a lot of stuff leading up to this, and uh, the prologue, I feel, is... Boring. Yeah, I know you thought it was boring. It's kind of boring. But right. there's also, especially if you're a nerd like me, there's some good stuff in it. Um, I did enjoy the chapter on pipeweed. I will say that. See, I, I look at that and I think that's kind of like the most pointless <laughs> thing. But some of the other, like, to me this is a very mm. meta chapter, meta Tolkien chapter, mm. you know? Mm. Yeah. Dude, that's totally meta. Probably like, Because, you know, it's like, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. But, um, yeah, so... As always, let's start off with some haiku. Let's do it. Um, let's let's just get this ball rolling. So, um, whose turn is it to go first? Um, I think it's your turn, right? Is it my turn? I feel like it's your turn. Are we not playing rock paper scissors again? We can do that. You want to play okay. rock paper scissors? No, grenades. Okay, fine. All right. Look, I am no nonsense about this tonight. Obviously, I am. I am determined to have an episode. Where we do not talk about spend fifteen minutes playing rock paper scissors. All right. We just took all the fun out of the podcast, John. We we got some we got some Lord of the Rings to talk about, so let's just get this party started. All right, all right. Fine. rock rock paper, paper scissors. scissors. Wait, no, rock paper scissors. Shoot. All right, rock guns now. <laughs> Including guns in this now. All right, now rock, rock paper, paper scissors, scissors. Shoot. shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I oh, win! No. Scissors, cups, paper. I wanted that to happen. Yeah, whatever. Same. You go. go. Like, I go first? You go first. Loser goes first. All right. Attention to haiku. Wait. What? ding a ling a ling a ling Haiku time. All right. No, that's out of the way. Yep. Hobbits. Little dudes that struck down Sauron. Also, invented smoking. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Although there's a spoiler alert in that haiku. Come on. I'm just saying. Like, I know. I thought that, but I was like, this is not the Silmarillion. Like, this is Lord of the Rings. Probably people know. But but it's not really a spoiler. That's the thing. Like, mm. Because you read the book, and immediately when you know who Sauron is, you know that he's the bad guy, and he's probably going to get defeated. But you don't quite understand that there's so much more to the story than that. That's the thing, right? That's true. So, I don't know, whatever. Like, maybe I'll go back and put a spoiler alert in there. I think that's a lame spoiler alert. Maybe it's only a spoiler alert, though, because I mentioned that it was a spoiler alert. Maybe. I I say just leave it alone. Maybe I was lying. And maybe you were. Maybe I was lying about this. Maybe I'm lying about the whole thing. 
Maybe, this, maybe I'm lying about Maybe this whole alert. podcast is really just a lie. Maybe Tolkien doesn't even exist. <laughs> okay, now you're taking this way too far. You crossed yeah. the line. Let's hear, let's hear a haiku. All right, here's my haiku. Shy of the big folk, though quite difficult to kill, for shoes they need not. Hmm. Mm-hmm. They need, oh, not, like N-A-U-G-H-T. Or N-O-T. For shoes they need not. They don't need shoes. Uh, that neck bothers me grammatically, but anyway, Never. I'll let it. I'll let it fly. I'll let it slide. Fine. All right, I got another one. What is luck? Perhaps we know quite little of those that rule the mundane. I think that one went over my head. Well, we'll get back to that. That was very meta, John. Let me say it again. Yeah. What is luck? Perhaps we know quite little of those that rule the mundane. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. Well, we're going to talk That's about luck good. later on. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Um. All right. Here's my other one. Long before a blue sky, hobbits imbibed their own art. The smoke of pipe weed. Mm-hmm. Bringing mm-hmm. it a little Breaking Bad reference there. I couldn't help it. Yeah. I just had to. Mm-hmm. The, the whole art thing, it just, you know, connected the two. The whole art thing? Art, right? I mean, Walter saw his blue sky creation as an art, mm. right? Tolkien describes the hobbits smoking in this pipe weed. I think that's a Breaking Bad spoiler alert that you filled on there. What? How is that a... Not a spoiler alert. Psych. <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe kind of. Maybe kind of, sort of. You never know. Well, maybe if this was a Breaking Bad podcast, okay, but it's not. Mm-hmm. Are you done? Yeah. Good. All right. So I didn't like either of my other ones. Oh, you got more? I had two more, but I really don't like them. Okay. It's up to you. No. I don't All know. right. Well, I don't like them either. Good. I'm glad we agree on something. Yes. For once. All right. So, um,. Hey, Greta, have you read my book yet? Nope. Dang. I'm too busy reading prologues to The Lord of the Rings that I didn't even know existed. You know, until uh, today. last week I met a guy um, who has read my book and is not married to me. Mm-hmm. And he spends all of his time helping poor people. And Right. I'm pretty sure he but had I think time he to also spends a lot of time um, in quiet. I think that's how they recharge if, to help. If that's what you need to tell yourself mm-hmm. for an excuse, then that's mm-hmm. fine. I'm but the key, the key point there is that he's the key point there is that he's not married to me, and you are, and I am, and you have to write my book. So that's a bit extra pressure on me. It's messed up. Read it. It's called Tolkien's Requiem. You can find it on Amazon, <laughs> downloadable in the Kindle format. Hopefully soon to come in a um, paperback version. Now, honestly, if it were in paperback, I would have read it already. Mm-hmm. I've decided that I don't like my Kindle. And the artwork is my favorite part of the book, and it would look like poo on my, art, black and my art, Kindle. The artwork that I didn't create. But you helped with the creative process of it. How do you know it's your favorite part if you haven't read the book? Well, I just know, like, I'm very much judge a book by its cover kind of person. Which is something you're not supposed to be. Which is not do. supposed to be the way I am. I know. But I've, I've just decided that I like paper but back books in my hands Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so tell it to the judge i am i'm telling it to the judge right now all right so prologue of the lord of the rings concern number one concerning hobbits concerning hobbits uh so we're gonna do a little hobbitology here we're gonna learn about we're gonna learn us about some hobbits i actually did enjoy this part i did enjoy it's it's kind of interesting you know it's kind of interesting because it was all downhill from there well then there was the pipe weed but after the pipe weed it was like well you learn you learn that there's like different types there's different breeds of hobbits Mm -hmm. yeah Um, i didn't know that yeah it's a little um it's it's kind of cool but Mm -hmm. before we before we talk about you know kind of the hobbitology part of it i wanted to discuss um the the nested storytelling that Tolkien undertakes here. Do you know what I mean by nested storytelling? No. Okay. Um, check this out. Further information 
will also be found in the selection from the Red Book of West March that has already been published under the title of The Hobbit. That story was derived from the earliest chapters of the Red Book, composed by Bilbo himself, the first hobbit to become famous in the world at large, and called by him there and back again. Okay, what what's weird about that? That little passage I just read to you. Um, I don't it, know. What's weird about it? Who wrote the Hobbit? Tolkien. Who does Tolkien say wrote the Hobbit? Bilbo. Yeah, that's what I mean by nested storytelling. Oh, I see. Right. Think about what oh, he's doing here. Right. Okay. And and this is important because he does this. He does this throughout. Right. Throughout his works, he is. Um, this is one of the key things that Tolkien does in in his works that I think makes him so fascinating is he takes he he's trying to create this effect of and this uh, aura of historicity right mm-hmm. that he's not just telling us a story and tra la 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 here's your story mm-hmm. um, he's he's telling you a story and casting it is like that he is just kind of the editor who was relating it a, a story that another person already told right within the universe this oh, other universe right within this other secondary world hence okay? the term nested right the whole the, uh, that's the whole idea I mean by mm-hmm. nested storytelling okay and and he kind of does that throughout right he does that at the end when he you know when you fast forward to the to the very end of uh, the prologue mm-hmm. the note on the Shire records and, and it's elsewhere in here, right? He does it in section four, but he, on the note on the Shire Records, he basically goes through all of the appendices at the end of Return of the King mm-hmm. um, and talks about them like like they were written by different characters right, from the story. Right, from the story, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, I see. Okay. So even though he made all of this stuff up himself, he's talking about it as if it was written, like that The Hobbit was actually just kind of adapted from... Or is essentially just the story that Bilbo wrote himself of his own adventures, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so by doing that, he is creating this sense of 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 nestedness and of depth, right? That there's that there's more than just two dimensions to this story, okay. right? It's more than just kind of the story that you're getting from the page, but there, there's kind of a, a whole universe that lies behind it. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that's. Um, that's important in order to understand the rest of the book, because we see we see kind of throughout the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien will go into kind of this further remove from his own voice or from the voice of the narrator, and go a level deeper, okay. right? Yeah, to where someone else is now relating something that happened within the story. I just really like this effect of storytelling. I mean, hmm. can you think of any other books you've read that? Do that sort of storytelling? Um, not off the top of my head. Do you see how it... Do you, th- do you think it gives it a, a sense... A, a greater sense of reality to do that? The nested storytelling? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How so? Well, because it... It makes it sound like more than just this tale that this guy made up in his spare time. Right? There's actually history and there's... Um, you know, that it came from somewhere other than him. But there's just more, you know, it's just, it's, it's in a, it's, he, he puts it in a broader context, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. Which makes it feel richer and, and more realistic, really. Yeah. Um, but it's still, it's still kind of a, it's still kind of a, I'm having a bit of trouble wrapping my brain around that concept. Because it's, I feel like in a way it's um, it's a little it's a little complicated, you know. Like it's just you're like, wait a second. I thought you wrote the Hobbit open. I've seen this guy did it, and that this is actually these appendices are written by these people, and you know I understand why he's doing it, but it, it kind of it complicates things a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think it does, and it, and it actually is a little bit. I think why the Lord of the Rings can be a difficult work when you're first starting out on it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's not it's it's not just like he's sitting there telling you a story. He's sitting there telling you a story within a story, right? Right. And um, 
and that does that can have some that can be difficult on the mind when it's trying to relate when it's trying to gain perspective right Mm -hmm. when it's trying to gain kind of the context of what's happening of the words that are being that it's reading right yeah exactly Exactly. all right i just wanted to point that out and and so that we're aware of it as we go through the prologue and and then other parts of the book and i think it'll also become clear why he's doing that when we read on fairy stories which you know we might do that actually before we start chapter one um go through on fairy stories because i really feel like we need to do that soon um because that's a really important work okay. for him. Anyway, so, um, Hobbits. What did you think about this this whole section on Hobbits? Um, I, don't, I, I enjoyed it. I, enjoyed, I feel like I, I knew a lot of it already. Yeah. Just from reading The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, but, you know, there, there was... I mean, there was still a lot of good... Um, you know, I enjoyed the history part of it because mm-hmm. I didn't know about the whole crossing the mountains and, you know, how they related to the other races, you know, the elves and the dwarves and the mm-hmm. men. You know, I, just, I didn't quite know where they fit in to the whole story. Did you know, so that are, was interesting. Are you able to use the maps to kind of, in the back, to kind of help you? Maybe no. Me and maps. Oh, yeah, maps. maps We're not uh, friends. Well... Well, anyway, we can look. At, I don't think can, I have a map in the back of mine. Is it the one in the front that you're talking about? This one? Uh, no, I'm talking about the one in the back. No, there's one in the back. There's not the one in the back of yours. There might be in the front of your in that one. Okay, but no, I, I didn't even look at the map. <laughs> the maps are the maps are useful. Um, you just got to get your bearings on them. Um, right. So, um. One thing at the bo- near the bottom of page two in the prologue, mm-hmm. right? Um, it says, "But in those days of Bilbo and of Frodo his heir, they suddenly became hobbits. Suddenly became by no wish of their own, both gri- both important and renowned, and mm-hmm. troubled the counsels of the wise and the great." Mm-hmm. All right, I want to compare that real quick with what Tolkien said in the Waldman letter way back in the Waldman letter in oh, the Silmarillion, okay. right? Okay. Where he says. Um, He's talking about the Silmarillion, and he says, The chief of the stories of the Silmarillion, and the one most fully treated in the story, is the story of Beren and Luthien, the elf maiden. Here we meet, among other things, the first example of the motive, to become dominant in hobbits, that the great policies of world history, the wheels of the world, are often turned not by the lords and governors, even gods, but by the seemingly unknown and weak, owing to the secret life and creation, and the part unknowable to all wisdom but one, that resides in the intrusions of the children of God into the drama. All right. So, Tolkien, this is, you know, he wrote this letter, what, I think in 1951, so right before the Lord of the Rings was going to come out. Okay. Um, and he basically says that hobbits are uh, indicative of this idea that the, the world is really even though we tend to think in terms of the big players and the grand events, um, mm-hmm. you know, we, we all want to latch on, latch our minds onto the kings and the queens and the lords and the governors and the generals and all of these guys, um, the rich and the beautiful and all of those. But that's not really, at the end of the day, how at least Tolkien is trying to say that there's this whole other thing that's going on underneath all of that mm-hmm. that we that we never really recognize, but maybe is really how history happens and how history changes, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's I think what he means by you know they came to trouble the councils of the wise and the great, right? That and that's I think one of the key themes of the Lord of the Rings overall. And if you go back to the Hobbit, that um the reason he starts to f- he focuses on hobbits here is because and and sweeps them up in these events is to say it's not always the big and the powerful like in the Silmarillion it's the big and the powerful typically that move things even though yes. that's not always the case but here it's the weak and the unknown mm-hmm. that start to that start to really have an effect right, right. that's a very biblical 
concept, mm -hmm. really, when you think about King David, right? I mean, he was the shepherd boy mm -hmm. who, you know, eventually um, rose to be a great king of Israel. Yeah. Um, and um, I think there was even something in the Bible that actually says that God uses the poor and the weak to confound the strong or something like that. No, I think you're right. I can't, I can't name chapter and verse, but... Um... Uh, no, I, I think you're right, and and that well, that's certainly a theme of the. I mean, a very strong theme in the New Testament. I mean, mm -hmm. you get, um, you know, Christ. All you know, Christ didn't come as a great and powerful king, right, mm -hmm. uh, or a general. He came as you know the poor son of a carpenter, yeah. right, mm -hmm. to uh, to a people who were enslaved, yes. right, mm -hmm. um. Or at least under the under the thumb of a much greater empire, you know, kind of a little backwaters territory yes. of a great mm -hmm. empire, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and then you know all throughout it talks about, and, and that's kind of the history of of Christianity, especially early on, was it spread amongst mostly amongst the poor, right, yes. and amongst and and it and it spread by people. You know, by helping the poor and uh, and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, you can see that reflected in Tolkien's own thought here, right? Mm -hmm. And again, on fairy stories would help us flesh this out a little more. But you can see this theme uh, very greatly. I'd also say that this is a strong theme in Leaf by Nagel, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, and it's maybe not told in the same way. Um, Niggle's life doesn't have the same um, impact on on this world that maybe Frodo's life is going to come to have. Yeah. But um, it's kind of this acknowledgement of the fact that even though you may not be able to look at somebody's life in the here and now and the effects of what they did in the here and now and see this great significance to it, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an eternal, a greater eternal significance than you realize. Right. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, and in the end, what really matters because what really lasts, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so I, again, I think it's important to get that out of the way and understand that a large part of why Tolkien, again, you got to be careful about saying that this is why he's doing it. At the end of the day, I think he just wanted to tell a good story, but. But we can see what was coming forth from his heart in, in identifying this, right? Yeah. That he wanted to have these characters. He was he's almost taking the the kind of the style and the scope of the Silmarillion, and then he's injecting these little people into it, mm -hmm. right? And saying, "What happens when I inject them into yeah. it? Yeah. How right. do they how do they mix it up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's talk some hobbitology. Okay. All right. So what are the three types of hobbits? Let's see. There are the Harfoots, mm -hmm. the stores, and the fallow hides. That's right. Um, tell me about tell me about the Harfoots. Um, let's see. The Harfoots they lived in the foothills and the mountains. Um, it says that they moved west early. Yeah. And um, they were the most normal and representative variety of hobbit. Right. So I guess that's just like that they were like the generic brand, I guess, of hobbit. Is that, generic is that what he's trying to say? <laughs> yeah, I, maybe. Yeah, and they, the de they definitely seem like that. I mean, just the way the way he describes them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they were far the most numerous. They were the most inclined to settle in one place and longest preserve their ancestral habit of living in tunnels and holes. Um, he describes them browner of skin, smaller and shorter, and they were beardless and bootless. Their hands and feet were neat and nimble, and they preferred highlands and hillsides. So, um, yeah. So they they sound kind of plain, yeah. As far as hobbits go, yeah. Um, yeah. And so stores. What about stores? Um, let's see. They they didn't go west until after the Harfoots, and they. Um, let's say. They preferred flat lands and riversides. Yeah. Um, broader, heavier in build. Their feet and hands were larger. Um, yeah. And then the fallow hides um, were fairer of skin and also of hair, and they were taller and slimmer than the others. They were lovers of trees and of woodland. So mm -hmm. you get the sense maybe that they were um, they were almost like kind of the no the more noble. 
Right, I think it says that. In appearance, right? yeah. It says that they were kind of the, the masters or the, right. the chieftains mm-hmm. often. That that's where the, the leaders, the, the families of leadership came from that tribe. Yeah, and interesting, it says, even in Bilbo's time, the strong Falahida strain could still be noted among the greater families, such as the Tooks and the masters of Buckland, mm. who were, so like Pippin, right, is Peregrine oh, right. Took, right? Right. Um, and then Mary Brandybuck is one, would be one of the masters of Buckland. I see. Um, okay. So, so those two would be kind of Fallowhidish, right? They're probably descended from the Fallowhides. Right. Um, real quick, on the note of so, even though you don't like maps, do you have so do you have one that looks like this in there, in your copy, um, like that? Mm. Let me see. Show me your maps. That one. That one. That's those two. Oh. No, I don't think I have that one. Those are weird. See, that's why I didn't look at them. Yeah, anyway. Uh, well, anyway. Um, oh, you know what? We won't worry about maps right now. Okay, we'll talk about maps another time. Um, I will say this, though. Do you understand kind of how how the time period so how this time period relates to the Silmarillion right because this is this is the third age right right and the Silmarillion actually where we stop in the Silmarillion mm-hmm. is almost like the the start of the first age right there's so yeah. there's the first age right, right, but right. there's all this stuff that happens before the first age right and so far in the Silmarillion we've been dealing with everything that happens before the first age I see the okay. rest of the Silmarillion that we're going to read is the first age okay okay all right. So the first age basically began when, um, with uh, Melkor becoming Morgoth and right. wreaking havoc. Okay. Right. And all and everything that went down two episodes and two episodes ago, and then um, and then the second age is Akalabath, and uh, that's that's after the Silmarillion proper, but it's still in this book in the Silmarillion book. Okay. Um, and that's about Numenor. We'll get to all that eventually. Um, but the second age is where Sauron really starts to become important. Okay. And he's kind of the chief bad guy in the second age. All right. Um, that's when he forges the rings. Hmm. Okay. And um, and then he uh, is defeated in the third age. The third age starts. The ring is lo- you know the ring is eventually lost. Okay. And the third age starts. And we pick up with hobbits. The sto- this story picks up like three thousand years into the third age. So this is way. Yeah, I mean, this is after, this yeah. is several thousand years after where we left off in the Silmarillion, okay. right? Okay. So you know, think about like here we are in the year two thousand, and this is like we're looking back at stuff that happened in one thousand BC, right? Uh, okay. Um, I okay. mean, even further back than that, really, right? Yeah. Because and think about how little we know about what happened back then. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, basically, we know nothing. Like, very, we know very little about, like, the actual history of those times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a little bit of idea, but nothing like we know of history, like from a hundred years ago. Right. Right. Um, so this is like the Silmarillion is ancient history. Okay. But unlike their world, all right. Unlike our world, their world has what in it. Their world has what in it that would, that would give it some continuity and give them some ability to understand what was happening all that time ago. I don't know. I'll give you a hint. They begin with an E and they make yummy cookies. <laughs> elves. Yes, elves. <laughs> That's right, because elves are immortal. That's right. So they've lived this whole time. Yeah, so you remember... Um, Galadriel, right, right. Mm-hmm. Galadriel showed up. We actually saw her a little bit in the what we've read so far in the Silmarillion. Yes. Guess what? She's in the Fellowship of the Ring, right? Right. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah. yeah. So hey, Galadriel goes mm-hmm. way back, right? Mm-hmm. Galadriel and Fanor used to uh, used to hang out, right, yeah. back in the Blessed Realm, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, I don't know if they really were like buddies or anything like that, but you know they they used to you know we'll just say they used to hang out, yeah. right? So. Gladriel knows all those folks. So it's not like even even though it's like really really super ancient, even 
uh, by our standards, um, they still have a sense of, con- of of strong continuity that we would not have with it because sure, of the right, fact that you've got have, Galadriel yes, and yeah. even Elrond, um, even though he doesn't show up until really late in the summer, in the first age, mm-hmm. um, he would still know a lot of he, he would still be close enough to it that he would have a lot of memory, right? So there's okay. some figures lingering like that. That makes sense. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of nifty how that works, but. Yeah. But even even so, just remember that like where we are with Bilbo and those guys is like it's it's like we're trying we've just jumped forward from like 1000 BC to the year 2000, or maybe even like the you know 3000 BC to the year 2000. Wow. Right? Yeah. Um, that's how that's how far back we're going. So. Okay. Or how far far forward we're going. Right. 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 Yeah. And so even in so he talks some about the Shire reckoning. Which is to say, like, it's kind of how, um, you know, if you were Muslim, you'd, you'd think this was like the year, like, 1300 or something like that. Because they date their, they date themselves from, like, the time of Muhammad, right? Right, right, right. Um, oh, I So see. that's what Shire Reckoning okay, is, right? Yeah, the yeah, elves have their that. way of reckoning, which is kind of like Second Age, Third Age. Mm-hmm. And then Shire Reckoning is its own time because, and, and Shire Reckoning is based on the time when these two Fallowhide brothers... Um, what are their names? Um, Marcho and Blanco, and Bla- mm-hmm. Marco, Marcho and Blanco, um, right. go to take care of a bridge, mm-hmm. and and they, that's when they that's when they found kind of founded the Shire. I see. Um, okay. So that was sort of the beginning of Hobbit, really civilization, right? Okay. Um, before they had been just kind of a you know, a wandering people without much of a history. Now they have, now they're starting to develop a, their own little kind of and mini civilization. Cal- calendar starts. Yeah. But, but even then they were, they were absorbed into the king, into the greater kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor, which were kingdoms of men. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and they were kind of vassals within those hobbits were. Hmm. So, um, and the origin of hobbits is mysterious, Right. It's kind of like we know this with all the figures. Yeah, it didn't like, go into that at all, did it? Yeah, it's just like, like they kind of. Well, but remember, weird. the origin of elves was mysterious, right? Like we don't we know where they started, just like we know where hobbits started, but we don't know like how they started. Well, we know that the elves were a result of one of the themes of the Einar of the, um, the Iluvatar, right? Well, that's true, but. But we don't know where did the uh, where did hobbits start. We don't know that the elves, we don't know that the hobbits weren't part of the music too, right? Obviously they probably were, right? I see. And in a, in a way that, you know, it'd be interesting to go back and look at this, the Isle of and think if we can kind of discern the hobbits in there somewhere. But, hmm. um, uh, but the elves, even so, like, even though they were in the music, that's still mysterious, right? Like, we know they were coming, but we don't completely understand their origin. We just know that the Valar were waiting for them and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they showed up. Right. Right? Yeah. They were there. Yeah, that's true. In a certain area. And that's kind of how it is with the hobbits. Like, when did the hobbits, like, just... Were they asleep for the first thousands of years of the world? Mm-hmm. And they just woke up by, you know, in this particular location and started spreading from there? It's just kind of mysterious, right? Yes, Where did yeah, they come from? That's true, yeah. And it's the same with men, too. Men just show up eventually in the first age. Um... Dwarves, we know we have some sense of where they actually came from because yes. we know, yeah, we know, about we know who made them. Yes. Um, so anyway, that's that's Shire Reckoning, um, and and then um, what do you what do you kind of, what's kind of your overall impression of the of the corporate personality of hobbits? How would you describe their them as? A group of people like what are you know what I'm saying like how how are what what's kind of their attitude what's kind of their disposition towards the world uh, I from reading this I and also I guess you know pulling from my knowledge from the other books as well I, get, I very much get the feeling that they are just kind of you know live and let live you know like they're like they would just rather keep to themselves and kind of do their own thing mm-hmm. and you know if if a, and you know, don't bother me, and I won't bother you, kind of deal. Right. 
Um, they just like to live in peace and smoke their pipe weed, and they don't want to fight. Um, in fact, I thought that was funny where they talked about how they talked about the wars, and they were saying how no war had been fought. You know, mm-hmm. the Hobbits haven't been involved in a war for in a long time, except you know when they had the Battle of the you know, whatever I forget what the name of the battle was, but there was a big war that the Hobbits did send some people to to help the king. Mm-hmm. But there's no record of that anywhere, right? right? right. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah. The Hobbits say they helped, but men they don't have any record of it. Um, so anyway, I just I think that they they're just a very peaceful you know, chill people that, mm-hmm. that, um, they don't really, they don't, they don't like adventure. They don't particularly like to leave their homes. Like they're just homebodies and they don't, you know, they, they don't tend to, to want to get involved yeah. in, uh, anything that really, that they don't, that they don't see a true purpose in. Right. And, um, uh, I like what he says um on page page five in my book book, but he says, um, they were in fact sheltered, but they had ceased to remember it mm-hmm. um that makes me just think a lot of uh of people in in the west and in particularly and yes. i think in in rich richer countries mm-hmm. where obviously this isn't true of everybody, but I think in general this kind of haze can can come to you that you know, we're because we have so much built up around us, um, and we've benefited so much from the past, from kind of the material blessings of those who have gone before us. Mm-hmm. Um, we start to forget how dangerous the world can be, and um, and we we're sheltered, but we don't even know that we are right. Yes. Um, because we've still got our problems, and we still have our little mundane problems compared to the problems of our ancestors. Mm-hmm. And we we just t- we just take so much. We have so much that we take for granted that we're like, man, we really should like. No people fifty years ago didn't take that for granted, right? Right. Um, That's true. You know so how, you know you forget how good you have it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have to stop myself and remind myself. You know, this is a first world problem. <laughs> Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The whole yeah, the whole first world problem yeah thing is uh, yeah that's kind of what I'm getting at. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but they do. They have it pretty good there in the Shire, even though um, the kind of the great kingdom that was there that they first started in, um, the kingdom of men, Arnor, which was there, has really fallen and is no longer there. They they've kind of um, they're still living off of that, right? Mm-hmm. They're still living off the protections of it. And the structure that it gave them, um, and you know they're doing okay. Um, so, uh, but over time, um, they speak less and less with elves and grow afraid of them and distrustful of those that had dealings with them. Uh, and the sea became a word of fear among them and a token of death, and they turned their faces away from the hills in the west. Um, they just com- continually turn more and more. Um, more and more inward, more, more and more away from anything in the outside world, and they're just comfortable to like, just live in that sheltered little mm-hmm. little place in the Shire. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I, I like what he says at the very end of section one. Um, Hobbits delighted in such things if they were accurate. They liked to have books filled with things that they already knew, set out mm-hmm. fair and square with no contradictions. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a great way of characterizing hobbits. Like just give it, I want you to, it's everything that I already know. I want that in my books. I don't want anything that's going to rock my boat intellectually. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and I want it set out fair and square. No funny business. Right. (laughs) Right. You know, just the facts, just the facts. Right. Um, I don't need any enticements to adventure or any, any other things like that. So just give it to me straight. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to know any new stuff. Don't go. Don't be going and doing research into other new things. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Don't rock my boat. Right. So. So that's hobbits for you. So. Um. You know we know a lot of the other stuff about them. They live in holes. Um, they call the holes, um, smeals, smeals, smeals. Um. They like 
they have uh, this word of madams. Um, oh, yeah. Those things that, that really don't have a use, but they're emotionally attached to them, and they right. don't want to throw them away. Right. Sound familiar? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> That's what we need. We need a... They, they actually had, like, a, a house, right? A math right. house. <laughs> That's what we need. We need a math house. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a funny little that's a funny little characteristic mm-hmm. of you know just kind of hoarders. You know they 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 they, don't, they never want to get rid of stuff. You know even though they right. might not really need it, they have some kind of emotional attachment to it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. emotional or sentimental attachment to it. Right. Um, all right. Well, what do you think? What do you think? What kind of hobbit do you think Bilbo and, and Frodo? What do you think the um, the Bagginses are? Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. Um, my guess. Um, well, I, I, by process of elimination, I'm pretty sure it's not the fallow hides. Mm-hmm. They weren't one of the notable families. Um, I would, I would guess honestly, they were Harfoots. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows for sure. Um, I think they've got some. I think they maybe got a little bit of all three of them in them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably more Harfoots and fallow hides. Uh, mm-hmm. just based on descriptions. Um, I, I feel like though, because of the, the advent, like, well, um, they are descended from the Tooks on, uh, I think on Bilbo's mother's side. Oh yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't know about Frodo's descent because Frodo's his nephew, so it wouldn't have been his mother. Um, but at least Bilbo, I think, has some fallow hide in him because he okay. has he has a Took ancestry. I see. Okay. Um, but I think they also have Harfoot on on the Baggins side. I think the Baggins side would be more Harfoot. Okay. Um, but no one, I don't think anybody knows for sure. I don't think Tolkien wrote it down anywhere. Um, maybe there's some textual clues that we'll find eventually, but you know, no. Um, all right. Well, let's um, let's pause there and take a quick commercial break, and we'll come back and finish the rest of the prologue. Sounds good. Don't go away. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the kernel of the Middle-earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril, one of the holy jewels of the Blessed Realm, from the Iron Crown of the Dark Lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers, In doing so, I aim to provide a backdoor into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash b-e-r-e-n. Happy reading! All right, we're back. Um, so we left. We just finished section one of the prologue. Uh, now we're at section two, which is concerning pipeweed. Um, I I just find it funny that Tolkien felt it necessary, you know, because I feel like the first part is pretty like it's, you know it's good to know more about hobbits. Sure. Yeah. The second part is like they are like one of the main characters after. Yeah. All. Yeah. Exactly. The second part is like concerning pipeweed, um, and actually I think this this actually has a little more relevance to it than we might realize. I don't know why he didn't include this in the appendix, maybe, but Hmm. um, he wanted to include it in the prologue. Um, I don't know. Do you feel like you took away anything important from this? Um, not really. No. I mean, I like that, um, I mean, again, it's just kind of, it it does, it provides you just a little bit more insight, I think, into the Hobbit's character. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, Mm -hmm. Just basically showing how they like to relax and what they do in their spare time. And, um, you know, just it helps to paint the picture of them more fully. I didn't, I I could have done without all the talk of where the, you know, who did it first, right? Was it Mm -hmm. the people in Bree or was it the people in, you know, whatever. Um, And the different varieties and, you know, I mean. Yeah. Well, I will say that I think this also helps the um, that effect of historicity and of you know secondary world truth, right? That he's going for. 
Um, oh, I see. Secondary right, reality. He's talking about Mary, right? Mary. Uh, is that what you mean? Well, that, that but he's, Mary but also just the fact that he wrote a whole section on the history of pipeweed, right? Right. And, and most of it is quoted from Meredith Brandy books. Right. That's true. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Herb lore of the Shire. Yes. yes. Herb lore of the Shire. Um, I did find it funny though that he basically attributes. He gives hobbits credit for inventing smoking, you know? Yes. <laughs> you know, that's like their one invention, their one original thing that they came up with. Right. Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, and then also just to say that the leaves came from Numenor, which that probably doesn't mean too much to you yet, but Numenor was... Numenor is almost like this... Um, Numenor was this realm in the Second Age that was um, the greatest realm of men ever known right and okay. it was it was actually an island given to men given to certain men um by the valar that was as close to the blessed realm basically as they could come i see right okay. as men as mortal men could come so the so tolkien is kind of i think he's giving pipeweed um kind of a special status as a flower in this way, right? As a, as a plant in this way. That it okay. comes from this really special place. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, anyway, that's all I really had to say about pipeweed. Um, Tolkien doesn't say that much about it anyway. Um, all right. Section three on the, of the ordering of the Shire. Um, I, you know, I mean, some of this is a little bit interesting. You know, the... The hobbits strike me as having a pretty, um, you know, anarchic is not a is not a favorite word because it sounds it sounds different to us. Like we're like it's revolutionary, but more along the lines of they just didn't feel like they needed much government, right? right. Yeah. They they were sort of self governing, and because they just wanted peace all the time, it was like we don't need mm-hmm. we don't need a bunch of like we don't need a big government structure, you know? Right. Um, right. Their mayors, they 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 had a thane who was more of a like kind of a king figure, mm-hmm. um, but he's less and less important. Um, they're the mayor; they're almost like ceremonial figures. And right. I like what they say about rules. Uh, for they attributed to the king of old all their essential laws, and usually they kept the laws of free will because they were the rules, as they said, both ancient and just. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the rules. They're just. These are the rules. These are the way they are. This is right. the way society is structured. Right. And we don't we don't break those, right? right. So there's no interest in, in you know, pushing the rules too far on a societal right. level. It's it's a, it's like they put a lot of weight on the intrinsic value of mm-hmm. of just common sense, really. Right. That you know you know it's wrong to yeah. kill another person, right? Yeah, you it's this just... it's this kind of common law, maybe even I don't know, natural law might not be the right term, but kind of because I don't think they think about it too much. I think they're just kind of like, these are the rules we have. They were given mm-hmm. to us, and mm-hmm. they've been here since forever, so why will we mess with them? Right. You know? Exactly. It's like... If it ain't broke, don't yeah, mess it. it. It's more like that, I yeah. think. It's not like... Because to me, the, like common law is more like, these are just always the way we've done it. Natural law is more like, well, this is the way things work, and that's more of a philosophical approach. Right. Common law is like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. Exactly. Um... I thought it was funny what they said about their sheriffs. The sheriffs. The sheriffs. How they, of course, they didn't have uniforms, right? Because right. Because they didn't, they didn't know about those things. They, they only had a feather in their caps. And they were more concerned with the strayings of beasts right. than of people. And they were also, their most of their work was to uh, basically make sure they, they, they weren't bothered right. by people from the outside. Keep an eye on people coming in from the outside. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that they, just make sure nobody bothers us, <laughs> right? Right. Right. Just let us smoke our pipe weed in peace and keep all the weirdos out. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, I like that too. Um, again, you're just getting this picture of the hobbits as people that want to be left alone. Yes, absolutely. And they're pretty, they're pretty happy as they are. They mm-hmm. don't need a lot of, they don't need a lot of help. I mean, there's something pretty admirable mm-hmm. about that that they can basically have a society where they're just content. Yeah. And um, they don't need a lot of special governance mm-hmm. oversight. Mm-hmm. They're just like. Stay the heck away from us right. and live and let live. Yeah, live yep. and let live. Yeah. Um, all right. Section four, um, which is probably the most important section in here. Yeah, I was a little. I was I'm kind of surprised it was in here. To 
be quite honest. And so I was like, I mean, most, um, I would mean, maybe this is just me making assumptions, but I would think that most people who are picking up the Lord of the Rings have already read The Hobbit, right? So I was wondering why he felt it necessary to recap the whole finding of the ring and the Bilbo and Gollum and riddles. And Well, did you pick, did, did you come up with an idea after reading it of why? Why you think he did? I mean, the only thing I could think of is, is you know, a couple of things that were mentioned that, that I didn't know about before, which was how Bilbo had first told a different version of the story. Um, and then that, um, you know, they, they kind of brought up the, the question of, did Bilbo really fight fair, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. right, with his riddle? Was it really a riddle or was it a question? And so, I, I mean, I don't know, except that really all it did was maybe raise some questions in my mind about Bilbo's character. Yeah. I want, so, I want you to take a step back for a moment and try and think about this from, suspend all the things that you know about the ring because you've read The Lord of the Rings before and because you've seen the movies and all of that. And, and consider that the only other thing you've ever read, like this is 1953 and the only other thing, you, you, you just got this from the bookstore and you love The Hobbit and you heard that a sequel to it just came out. Mm-hmm. And... I want you to think about what you know about the ring at that point. What do you know about the ring from reading The Hobbit? Um, well, I know that it was Gollum's prized possession mm-hmm. and that it made people invisible who put okay. it on and that it, people that have it have this weird desire to never let it go and it has a way of Corrupting people. You don't know that. Yeah, I do from The Hobbit. How do you know that part? Because Bilbo, right? Is it? It sh- it you, you? It tells you how Bilbo is affected by it. How's he, how's he affected by it other than gaining invisibility? He doesn't. He doesn't like. He can't get rid of it. Like he's he he wants. He doesn't want to get rid of it. And I feel like there's the scene in the movie. Not you. You can't. Oh, you can't the say them. You can't see the movie. Right. Okay, so maybe I don't know that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but I just I still feel like we know that this ring is something that Bilbo has, and it's like a very it he it's he has a very strong attachment to it, uh-huh. and he takes very special care of it. Maybe we don't know about the corruption part of it yet. So I. Th- I would say that you know you do know that Gollum it's Gollum's prized possession and he's really right. mad when he loses it. Right. Um, he wants to kill Bilbo for, right. for taking it. Right. And you know it grants Bilbo invisibility. Those are about the only two things that you know about the ring at that point. Right? Okay. Maybe. You don't know anything else really in the grand scheme of things. I mean, if you really think about it, like when you if you're in those shoes, you don't know anything other than those two things. Okay. Um, and you know that this book is called The Fellowship of the Ring, which you're like, what? Is that the ring? Is that Bilbo's ring? Right? What's this all about? Okay. So, um, my point is, Tolkien is trying to refocus the narrative back to the ring. That we maybe, that was almost just kind of like a subplot of The Hobbit, right? It was just this thing that happened that enabled Bilbo to do some other things, right? Um, I don't... I'm pretty sure Tolkien didn't have it mapped out when he wrote The Hobbit that this was going to be the case with the ring. And in fact, he had to go back and edit The Hobbit when the second edition of The Hobbit came out and change the story of Bilbo's finding of the ring significantly. Really? Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is that? Because originally, well, so let's read this now and find out why. And remember that Tolkien is doing a meta thing here, right? He's talking about, oh, remember all that stuff about Bilbo changing yeah, his story? Yeah. Okay. So what did Bilbo, um, what did Bilbo tell everybody was what happened with this, with the ring, with how he found the ring? He said that it was a present. Right. That Gollum had given it to him as a present for winning the riddle contest. Right. And how did he really get it? 
to see did Gollum actually hand it over to him be like here you go buddy good job you won the contest <laughs> right no not now, at all. and Bilbo to be to fair Bilbo it. didn't actually say that originally he he said um where is it um um called the rings oh I had it marked somewhere but anyway um what has it's got uh, I don't know I've got it marked some here here somewhere anyway um Bilbo latches on um so Gaul okay, Gollum Bilbo had said Gollum basically gave me the ring, right? Mm-hmm. Um when I won the contest. Mm-hmm. Right? Um and then showed me the way out. Mm-hmm. Right? But of course that wasn't what really happened. Now why did Bilbo try to do that? Why did he try why to did, why did why did Bilbo change his story? Change the story from what actually happened. Why would he have done that? Is this like a meta question? Kind of. Well, I mean, why now? Now, okay, now turn on what you know about the ring. Uh-huh. Why would Bilbo change his he story? He doesn't want to lose it. Huh? He doesn't want to lose it. He doesn't want to sound like somebody that stole it. Right. He wants to shore up his ownership of the ring right so there's no question about it Mm. right Uh it's given to me fair and square i won a contest and it was given to me fair and square without any controversy right right um he because if he goes and he says i stole it even though this guy wanted to kill me and i had to get away to save my life i still it still sounds fishy that maybe Maybe Gandalf or somebody else with their stupid laws will try to make, will take the ring from me and say we have to give it back to Gollum because it's rightfully his, you know? You know, what he actually said was that Gollum was going to give him a present and then when Gollum went to get it, it wasn't there, right? Because Bilbo already had it in his pocket and so instead he was like, okay, you don't really have to, it's okay, I don't don't need the ring, just show me the way out and I'll count that as my reward. Right, 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 yeah. But even so, that still makes it sound like mm-hmm. the ring is his. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and well, and then he later on realizes that oh, that's what he was going to give me, right? Right. You know, because he he knows that Gollum called it his present, and he realized okay, here's here's my present. So so it still it makes it sound like Bilbo is basically saying, um, he was going to give this to me anyway. Right. So right. It's mine. Yeah. So yeah. it's and by for all intents and purposes, it's mine. I see. Um, so when that's how Tolkien originally wrote the story, right? Gollum was, was that, Gollum. Was, it was not this huge point of controversy with Gollum originally. Gollum was not screaming at Bilbo in the first edition of The Hobbit really? when he took the ring, right? Huh? Um, yeah, maybe on the next episode I'll try and I'll try and go find that chapter and maybe we can have a little reading from it. But in the original version, Gollum is more like. Can you still get the original version? You can. I mean, you could. You know, you can't get the original. Well, I think, I think you can get. Um, you might be able to, but I'm sure I can find find it somewhere on the internet. Okay. Find the passage at least. So basically, Bilbo. Well, here he's. Yeah, this is a meta Tolkien thing, right? Like Bilbo, it's Tolkien that went back and edited it, but he's saying that Bilbo is the one that did it. Right. right. So is he basically trying to make? He's, he went back and revised the story to make it be more controversial. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Because he knew that the ring... Because he didn't know when he first wrote it, everything that the ring was going to be. And right. So he had to rewrite it. Because if the time. ring really had those powers, and if it was really the thing that corrupted Gollum in the first place, then, you know, how could uh, how could Gollum just give it up? like that so easily, right? right? How could Gollum just be okay with that, right? So Tolkien didn't know everything that the ring was going to be. Right, when, when he, he originally wrote, wrote it. Right, when he okay. originally wrote The Hobbit. Okay. Um, now, when he took the ring and he was like, okay, now I have to figure out, now I have to explain why I did it the wrong way the first time around, right? So he right. works in, again, Bilbo wrote The Hobbit, 
right? Right. So that's how he explains this. And then he goes on and does kind of this narrative history of it to say that, well, really Frodo, you know, and, and, and the other guys who came after Bilbo were in charge of keeping those records and they started telling the true story um, right. later on, right? Um, he says, um, evidently it still appeared in the original Red Book as it did in several of the copies and abstracts. But many copies contain the true account as an alternative, derived no doubt from notes by Frodo or Samwise, both of whom learned the truth, though they seem to have been unwilling to delete anything actually written by the old hobbit himself. Uh, Just, I guess, because they had too much respect for for Bilbo. Right, right. And didn't want to make him out to be a a liar. Um, But Gandalf uh, disbelieves Bilbo's story as soon as he heard it, and he continued to be very curious about the ring. Eventually, he got the true tale out of Bilbo after much questioning, which for a while strained their friendship. But the wizard seemed to think the truth important. Though he did not say so to Bilbo, he also thought it important and disturbing to find that the good hobbit had not told the truth from the first, quite contrary to his habit. Uh, The idea of a present was not mere hobbit-like invention all the same. It was suggested to Bilbo as he confessed by Gollum's talk that he overheard. For Gollum did, in fact, call the ring his birthday present many times. Um... That also Gandalf thought strange and suspicious, but he did not discover the truth in this point for many, many years, as will be seen in this book. So Gollum, you know, called the ring his birthday present, right? Right. Um, So we're going to learn about, you know, where that all came from, right? Why it was his birthday present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, you know, all that, Tolkien is really setting the stage for why the ring is such a, for what the ring really is here, right? Um, this is not the trinket that it seemed to be in The Hobbit, the, the useful trinket that it seemed to be in The Hobbit. Okay. This is Let's something with much greater significance that Bilbo doesn't even realize. And, um, you know, if he says right there at the beginning of Section 4, he found the ring, he put it in his pocket, it seemed then like mere luck. Um, and it, at the end of The Hobbit, one of my favorite things at the end of the the book, The Hobbit, is um, like the last, Gandalf's last words to Bilbo. Uh, Bilbo says, uh, Then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion, said Bilbo. Of course, said Gandalf, and why should them not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck just for your sole benefit? Um, You are a fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you are not, but you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. Um, There, you know, Gandalf's words are kind of whimsical there, but they really point to the fact that Bilbo has been drawn up into something much greater than he really realizes, right? right. That his um, his actions have taken on a much greater significance than he probably realizes or will ever realize. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Tolkien is again with this section and the prologue drawing our attention to that fact mm-hmm. that he's quite a little. You know, you are quite a little fellow, right? But. This is not really mere... Even though it feels like mere luck that you found the ring, there's much more going on here than you realize. Right. Right? Yeah. That's kind of what I was trying to get at in that haiku at the beginning. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, um, that there's other powers who are, who are kind of maybe even orchestrating all this and, um, and trying to bring these great things about. And it's very mysterious... Um, and that's one of the key, I think that's one of the key themes we're going to deal with throughout the Lord of the Rings as we read it right that there's why are you know why are like these forces of good kind of acting so covertly you know like why are they acting in the shadows to bring these things about right you know why why are the you know Whoever whoever is doing it, whoever bring whoever is responsible for bringing Bilbo to the ring, mm-hmm. right? Um, why do we know so little about that process that we just basically attribute it to mere luck, right? Mm. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um, I also liked what he said about the about like the authorities and riddles. The authorities, it is true, differ whether this last question was a mere question yeah. and not a riddle according to the strict rules of the game. I thought that was funny. I, uh, I, he capitalized the authority, so I was, I was kind of curious as to, like, is Tolkien being cute there? Because I kind of thought he was done being cute in The Lord of the Rings. Um, but maybe he actually means, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who he means by the authorities. He seems to mean somebody because he capitalizes it, but I don't know. You didn't pick up on anything there, did you? Not really. No. Yeah, I didn't know who he was talking about either when I read that. But I, I agree. I mean, I, 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 yeah, it seems more like a question than a riddle. It doesn't seem like it was maybe quite fair, but. Mm-hmm. But with, but if, you know, Gollum, I mean, um, Bilbo had to get out of there. Right. Without with the ring, so. <laughs> right. Right. You know, I mean, another ending would not have done. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. Exactly, it is what it is. All right. Um, well, the note on the Shire records. Um, I feel like, again, there's some. I think this is mostly talking about the appendices and, um, and where those came from. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really feel like this is terribly important to deal with right now. Except just to say that it exists and it tries to contextualize even the appendices in terms of um, characters from the Lord of the Rings having written them. Right, right? attributing the append what the information the appendices to yeah to, again that whole nested storytelling exactly yeah the idea of the nested storytelling yeah so we've got we've got some nested storytelling um, we've got the concept of um, the weak and the unknown being the ones that drive uh, that drive history, right? Mm-hmm. That change mm-hmm. history. Um, and we've got the the influence of the ring on a good hobbit, such that it's able to cause him to lie in a subtle way in order to shore up his his yeah, claim to ownership yep. of the ring, right? They can do something so contrary to his. Character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very contrary to his character. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the idea of mere luck. What's really going on, right? What's really going on and the things that right. these little coincidences really that luck? happen. Yeah. Exactly. There's something more. So lots of uh, lots of good themes, among other things that we'll be dealing with as we go further into the the Lord of the Rings. Um, any other thoughts you wanted to share? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, interesting alright cool well um, so next time uh, you know I haven't completely decided what we'll read next time as of right now but it'll either be chapter one finally finally or um, it will be part of on fairy stories part right because it's kind of long it's pretty long I don't know if we can cover it all in one episode um so maybe we'll split it up into two episodes. Okay. Then again, maybe we'll just hit the high points and on fairy stories instead of covering every single detail of it, like as we want to do. Maybe you could just lecture me on it, so I don't actually have to read it. No, you don't get out of it. <laughs> Sorry. you got to read. Uh, if high schoolers can read it, I guess I can read it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I was, I was really looking forward to getting started with the Lord of the Rings. No. All right. Well, we'll but see. if you think fairy stories will enhance on fairy stories will enhance my reading of the Lord of the Rings, then I can probably I kind of do stomach it. But we'll see. We'll okay. decide. Keep you hanging. Yeah, you'll probably know in just a moment because I'm probably gonna tell you when I uh, record the outro for this thing. So you know, I'll just They'll stop know talking. I'll know. They'll know They'll probably know before, before you know. I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll I'll find out next week. A few hours before the podcast. Oh, by the way. By the by. This is what we're talking about tonight, so go read it. That's right. Yes. That's how I roll. <laughs> all right. Well, it's time to say goodbye. So It is. Thank you all for listening. Goodbye. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes as well as other Tolkien goodness. Also, we hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as we enjoy making it please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. 
On the next podcast, we will discuss Tolkien's hugely important essay on fairy stories. Because, well, we just have to before we start into The Lord of the Rings. After covering the critical concepts and on fairy stories, we will begin our journey with Bilbo, Frodo, Sam, Gandalf, and the rest of the gang with Chapter 1 of Fellowship. I hope you'll tune in. Thanks for listening.